in this country and starting here at Politicon. So we've got a great roster of panelists today. I want you to give a big Politicon welcome to all of our panelists. Let's bring them out. All right, so some quick introductions here. Uh, first of all, uh, to my far right, we have Kyle Kalinske. He is the co-founder. Yeah! Woo! We've got a few friends. Woo! Kyle's the co-founder of Justice Democrats and host of Secular Talk on the Young Church Network. Big Seltzer! To his left, we have Dakari Sellers, uh, who is a former state representative in South Carolina, now a CNN contributor. To his left, we have the Roman Millennial, a.k.a. Lauren Chen, and she is the host of Roman Millennial Uncensored on YouTube. And then to my left, we have Michael Knowles, host, host of the Michael Knowles Show on the Daily Wire. And to his left, we have Charlie Kirk, founder of the Trump So, just to frame this discussion for a second here, uh, we obviously live in very polarized times today. Our political rhetoric is as divisive as it's been probably in our lifetimes. And just to put a finer point on the level of polarization today, studies have shown that the levels of partisanship, partisan polarization in Congress, are at the widest they've been since the end of Reconstruction. And you only have to look to the headlines in this country to see just how divided this country is. And I think, in my view, that partisanship has really metastasized into tribalism today. So I hope with the panel we can talk about you know, how we do bridge the political divide in a media environment where it's very difficult to do it. And I think all of our panelists here are on the cutting edge uh, of new media. And so it's really going to be on the folks here to figure out how we can create a more constructive political dialogue. And, and so I actually want to start with Bakari, because you have transitioned from a governance role, having served in the state legislature of South Carolina. You were the nominee for lieutenant governor uh, in, was it 2014? 2014. Uh, and so you were in the business of trying to form legislation and work with both Democrats and Republicans uh, in the legislature. And then you transition to a commentating role uh, at CNN and a number of other platforms. So tell us more about that transition, that process, and the change in incentives that you found in terms of the type of political dialogue that would get attention and that would work. Well, first, thank you for the question. Thank you all for, for being here. Uh, I was very young when I ran for office, and so I know we have some people in here on the left and the far left. I know we have some people in here on the right and the far right. Um, but I firmly believe that we're not the generation of tomorrow, we're the generation of now. And so I encourage everyone here, when I was 21 years old, I announced my race for office. I ran against somebody who was 82 years old and had been in office for 26 years. Um, and on June 13, 2006, I became the youngest black elected official in the United States and the youngest state legislator. But the reason, the reason that I was able to do that is because uh, regardless of how someone looked, regardless of where someone came from or their zip code, I always gave people the benefit of their humanity. And I think if we start there, if we meet people where they are, um, then we can find initiatives that all of us can agree on. Uh, to have Charlie to my left and to have my good friend from the Young Turks to, the, to my right, I can honestly say that if we were to put forth an idea like making sure that uh, we take redistricting, which is the reason that we're so polarized today, out of the hands of elected officials and made them independent, con independent commissions statewide, then I can actually get these two to agree on that and push it in state legislatures around the country. So, but, it, but it takes those type of bold steps. It, it takes people uh, not getting caught up in petty differences. Um, and it also takes people understanding the practical reality of where we are in this country. I tell people we made a lot of progress, but we still have yet a ways to go. Yeah. 
Well, just to pick up on that issue of gerrymandering and the importance of our generation, a lot of people don't realize this, but in the state of Ohio this year, uh, I run a nonpartisan organization called the Millennial Action Project. We work with young elected officials across the aisle. And it was the young lawmakers in Ohio who pushed a bipartisan plan to put in place redistricting reform in Ohio to get rid of partisan gerrymandering. And it passed with wide bipartisan support. The voters approved it with 75% of the vote. And I think that just underscores the opportunity our generation has to transcend some of the old divides that have been holding our country back. Uh, and since you called out, out Charlie, I'm gonna move over to Charlie here. Uh, you've been working on college campuses across the country. What's the sense that you're picking up from college students today in terms of the type of rhetoric that they're looking for? Um, when I go to college campuses, for example, I hear so many young people who say, I'm so tired of the partisanship. Um, I'm, I'm so tired of all the gridlock. And I'm curious if you hear a similar thing and, and how folks in Turning Point are, are responding. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I think the, the good news politically about our generation is I think we agree generally on the problems. We have a lot of different perspectives on how we would go about solving them. The broad-based consensus amongst college students and millennials is that we have a government that does not represent our generation, that is run by trial lawyers, lobbyists, well-connected people around the 90-mile proximity of Washington, D.C. Our argument as conservative libertarians is, well, if that government has been bought and is corrupt, why on earth would you want to make that government bigger, stronger, and send more of your money to that very same government? And that's obviously where my progressive friend, friends would disagree. So the, the, the broad-based question here over the last 30 to 40 years is why has the wealth, power, money, and influence concentrated around our nation's capital? What do they create? Well, they create nothing. They create access to power. I mean, the wealthiest counties in America used to be around Detroit, Michigan, and Chicago, Illinois, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Now, eight out of the 10 wealthiest counties in America are around Washington, D.C., where you're literally rewarded how close you are to the power center. And for us to get away from that, I think there's, there are some solutions that I would actually tend to agree with, whether it be fair, fair maps and so forth. But I think our generation is looking for a series of policies and ideas that will, I think, address in a, not necessarily, I, I hate that term bipartisan, because it, it almost lends itself to that both Republicans and Democrats are the answer. I would say, in some ways, it's bigger than partisan issues in some ways. And I look, if you follow my, what I say closely, I think that until the Republican Party is honest with ourselves with the failures of our own party over the last 30, 40 years, such as George W. Bush was a big spending liberal that betrayed all of our principles time and time again, we're not going to be able to actually appropriate the you know, solutions that will um, increase freedom and uh, shrink government and put the same government that's bought for, by these corrupt lobbyists and um, insiders uh, back to the people. Yeah, that's a great point. And uh, Charlie, I'm going to now go over to Kyle here because you made the point about this uh, widening gap between you know, Washington, D.C. And, and the rest of the country, not only in terms of power, but also in terms of now income. And I've heard this divide in America reframed particularly after the 2016 election. It's not so much between left versus right, it's really kind of the haves and the, the have-nots. I know this is an issue that you know, you've talked about. Um, what can we do to bridge that sort of divide? Well, I want to just take a step back real quick and say I actually surprisingly agree with a lot of what Charlie Kirk said. And he made a point to bring up you know, the size of government and how perhaps we have some large disagreements on that. Well, I actually want to reach out and say maybe there are many areas where we totally agree on the size of government. So when it comes to, for example, you know, warrantless NSA spying, if you tell me, hey man, listen, I hate big government, I don't want it intervening in my, in my life in that realm, well, I say, you're goddamn right, and let's work together to try to get rid of warrantless NSA spying. Good, good. So I'm happy to hear that. And there's other areas too, like, you know, the drug war, for example. That's giant government, and it ruins people's lives when they go in prison for smoking weed or something like that. And even, I would even go as far as to say, like, there's a lot of agreement between what I would call the populist left and uh, the libertarian right. So Rand Paul, for example, he's relatively consistent in an anti-war stance, and of course, if you're pro-war, you are pro-big government by definition, because Right, so if you're anti-war, I'm anti-war too, and we can agree on that. I'd be wonderful. Think it's a horrible thing, yes. Okay, so now we just both ruined our careers because we agreed on something. <laughs> um, we both have principles, so that's... Okay, I'm going to that, man. The only point where I 
disagree with. I don't think George W. Bush was a liberal. I think he was a warmonger and a neoconservative. And yep. One of the worst presidents well, much he's ever seen. Okay, but let me add context to it. Medicare Part B, borrowing eight trillion dollars. That, that was private. No child left behind. But that's, not, that's not. 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 That's grow the size of government tremendously. He created a new government agency, Department of Land Security, of which you put more under a traditional left-wing, you know, world. But it's, it's what were the priorities when he grew government, and when you spend seven trillion dollars on the war in Iraq, that's what it's projected to be by 2053, that's not a left-wing priority. It was the left who was standing. It was Bernie Sanders who voted against it. Yeah. Alright, I'm going to bring Lauren here. So, we were talking before this panel about the incentives involved in having an online uh, TV show. And I personally struggle with the incentives on social media generally, including YouTube, because the most inflammatory rhetoric gets the most views, the most retweets, you know, the most you know, followers. And so I'm curious from your perspective, having you know, run a very successful online show, how do you have a constructive conversation when the incentives seem to be pushing you in the opposite direction. Well, that is something that I'm always struggling with, and it actually came up about uh, in our fake news panel yesterday. Um, you know, someone asked one of the journalists that was there, uh, why aren't we talking more about the big issues here, uh, places where there's genocide and starvation? Why are these fake news headlines getting so much attention? And she gave the very frank answer, and said, that's what people are attracted to, and it doesn't matter whether we pu publish the other stories or not, it's not what's getting shared, and as an independent creator, you're, you're very aware of that fact. I mean, we can spend weeks researching a video about something like political philosophy or the public school system, and it'll get a fraction of the views that some, you know, right feminist ownage video will get. And it, it's kind of frustrating, but at the same time, I, I'm trying to look at it in the way that at least people are getting involved in these issues and you know my hope is if they see something that's maybe a little bit sensationalized and radicalized, not that I agree with doing anything purposely provocative just to upset people, but you know maybe then they'll stick around for a little bit of the deeper conversation, maybe then they'll start to realize alright well why is that happening and hopefully at, at the very least it can lead to a deeper conversation. It's not going to be everybody, some, some people just like the, I guess, the outrage machine, but there are a lot of people who are going to stick around maybe for the deeper conversation. Right. And, and Michael, you have an online show as well. Say more about the incentives that you've seen uh, from your experience. Well, the, what I find is that people reward authenticity. Audiences reward authenticity. You cannot pretend to be something you're not. Uh, audiences are not going to turn up. And that's why I hate to break up our kumbaya feelings here. I love the polarization. I love it. I love the partisanship. I spent a long time researching a book that I wrote called Reasons to Vote for Democrats. It's quite thorough, by the way. Very thorough book. Uh, I love it. I want a choice, not an echo. I don't want mealy-mouthed kumbaya. I don't want anything. I want to know when I'm voting who I'm voting for. In the 1930s and 40s, one of the major complaints of political scientists was that the parties were indistinguishable. You, you had, uh, on issues, anything ranging from life to taxes to death, whatever, uh, people uh, having unfair points of view. Now I know on all of those issues, on the size of government, on the role of government, on socialism, on life, on marriage, on death, on everything, I know where the parties stand. I, that, that's the country that I want to live in. It gives me a choice, not an echo. The conservative movement was founded in this. How do we get along? I have a simple answer. We win and you lose. And that might seem a little harsh. That might seem a little harsh. But there is no choice. To quote Ronald Reagan, St. Gipper, there is no choice between freedom and slavery. These are not morally equivalent. When, when one party has elected leaders saying that we should go to Republicans' homes where their children sleep, we should physically mob around them, though there is not a moral equivalent to some harsh rhetoric from a little old man on my internet show. Those are not the same thing. I'm glad that there is a difference now. And that's, that is my, maybe that will be the sequel to my, uh, to my bestseller. Uh, all of the reasons, to, all of the reasons to vote for Democrats part two, we win, you lose. So, I want to just pick up on that real fast. Well, okay, okay. so, okay. Well, just one second. So, uh, hold on, you, I think it's, uh, in a democracy we need choices. Yes. That's right. And, pro-choice, you might say. Well said. 
Uh, but I think the issue that we're trying to pick up on here is not that having diverse views is bad, but a zero-sum politics in which one side wins at the expense of the other side, and that's the only way that we frame issues how, that has a destructive effect. How could one side win and not at the expense of the other side? On the question of the life, we've been talking about Roe versus Wade a lot because of the nomination of Brett Kavanaugh. On the question of life, how does one side win without the other side lose? You're talking about protecting the life of an unborn baby or snuffing out the life of an unborn baby. I don't see a compromise there. I don't see a conciliation on that issue. I agree that the question of life is probably the, you specifically chose. But I mean, that's hard it's a, to bridge. It's a, no, it's a bullshit talking point because of the fact that what we're doing is here. What we're doing is we're finding these hyper sensationalized metrics by which to measure how we vote for people. But what we're talking about is how do we improve individuals' lives? And yes, you're going to have individuals like like Tim Kaine, for example, who abides by his belief, who is very, very much pro-life, who is a Democrat, but he votes in a, in a manner that's reflective of a Tim Kaine is pro-life? Tim Kaine is pro-life. No, Tim, Tim Kaine supports legal abortion. I, I just, but first of all, that's what I just said. That's literally, that's literally what I just said. I said, but he votes his constituency in Virginia. But what I'm trying to do is move the conversation beyond this conversation of life, because that's where we get bogged down. I, I but let's actually, but well, let's actually, but let's actually, my only point to you is that, listen, we can talk about, if we want to just sit here and we want to have a discussion that goes nowhere, we can talk about what, we can talk about issues of life where we probably will disagree. We can talk about issues of race where we probably will disagree. But let's actually talk about something substantive that we can find, probably find common ground on. Like, how do we make sure that people have health care in this country? How do we make sure that kids get properly educated in this country? Because what I will not do is waste time on discussions that people just per per that we continue to have these same discussions and sensationalize it so people get clicks. Um, this is not a click. That's right. Glad you know you guys are against the death penalty. I just want to say that. I, I'm you're so pro life. So you know, I'm against the death penalty. See? I love the death penalty. I'm not so you're not pro life. 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 No, I'm, I'm pro life. No, but <laughs> I think I think the <laughs> Which unfortunately, one I think party in this country so, has a ban. So, so the murder gets more time than the best. Let's just cut through. Let's just cut through the talking guys, points because, guys, like, guys, yeah. If you're for due process, you're against Gitmo. Uh, guys, yeah. guys. If like, you're for due process, you're against Guantanamo Bay. So, like, no, no, no. I'm, I'm for due process for American citizens. I'm not for due process for rumor terrorists. All right, guys, I'm going to step in here. I'm going to see the convention protections themselves. I'm going to step in here. This is going to be easy if he keeps walking right. right into the trap like that. <laughs> so, um, Charlie, I didn't want, I, did you, were you going to say no, something? No, I'm enjoying being the poem with that. Okay. <laughs> this is a major change, Charlie. I'm being the arbiter. You know how Cory Booker had his Spartacus moment? I'm having my Charlie Burke moment. Oh, okay. So I'm going to so go back to the affiliation. Um, I'm going to go back to the car here because I think if you want to jump in, I, we, well, I mean, we didn't want to mansplain everything to <laughs> But uh, just, just even with the issue of abortion, I think, and this applies to most issues, it is very easy to see it as black and white. But even that whole dichotomy you have of pro-life versus pro-choice, that doesn't even fully encapsulate the range of political views Correct. that people yes, use, right? And there are so many things when it comes to specifically abortion that we can talk about. We can talk about um, how, how do we make sure that if people want to have a, uh, adoption, that that is easy and available for them. How do we make sure that people are aware of different contraceptive methods so we don't have the unkind pregnancies in the first place? Like, the, like we either we kill all the babies or no one has. That's a very constructive way to look at the situation. And I mean, abortion, if there ever is one, people would think it's black and white, but it's really not. So, yeah, I, I get it. So, so Bakari, I'm gonna do this as respectfully as possible, because if I, if I didn't do this, I would regret it. Preparing for this moment. <laughs> go, let's go. Can you tell by the shoes? I don't even know what those are. I don't know what those are. Well, Charlie, 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 the shoes are, are irrelevant. Are irrelevant. Are you, excuse me. Oh, 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 guys, no, we're not going I have to never. On cable news, you said when Kanye West entered the Oval Office, this is what happened. Choice when choice. Black people don't read. Do you regret? That's not what I said. What did you say? Well, let's actually. If we want to go back. And no, I mean the tape said this is what happens when black people don't. That's read. not what I said. What did you say? I actually said that this is a discussion, and my major issue with Kanye West is that he attempts to make anti-intellectualism cool. And what I said is that you we said this is what happens when black. People that's not what I said. That's what the transcript. Actually, I said, Charlie, do you want? You asked me a question, so I want to. Do you regret? 
No, I don't regret anything, Charlie. So this is the point. So I said, <laughs> I went, what I, that's not what I said. If you want to know what I said, I'm going to tell you. I said that I have a problem with Kanye West because he attempts to make anti-intellectualism cool. I say there are many people who want to talk about criminal justice reform who will not send Kanye West to the White House to do that. I say Kanye West is what happens when Negroes don't read. You know what that is? That is a fact. Oh, so, wait, so you did say it. I say Kanye West is what happens when Negroes don't read. That's right. what I just said. No, that's not what you just said. He's a genius. Wait, I was But time out, but time out. He's a genius. Kanye, time out, time out. What, 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 what is... Kanye West, and I don't even know why we're here. Because you said we need to have conversation on civility. You go on cable news and say that a seven-time Grammy winner, multi-billionaire, courageous man going to the Oval Office is what happens when people don't leave. That's not what happens. First of all, you're a hypocrite. First of all, tell me you're going to have a conversation. All right, so what we're going to do here is the policy. Let's that for a second. But, 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 and you bash a successful man that has the down to wear and make America great again. You deserve to get the whole house for that. Okay. All right. I'm going to come in here. This is the car that helped us find. And we're going to go to the top of So personally, I love when we feign indignation. That's like the cutest thing ever. That, but but on, a, on, a more, on, a, on a much more specific note, um, first of all, it's factually accurate because Kanye West is literally a quoted non-reader. He doesn't believe in reading. Okay, so, so that bothers me. But if we're going to have a conversation about criminal justice reform, I actually want somebody who is articulate on the issue of making sure that we ban for-profit prisons. I want somebody who wants to end the prohibition on marijuana. I want somebody who's going to actually go and talk about putting rehab and social programs in prisons so when people get out, we don't have high rates of recidivism. I want somebody who can actually talk about issues that are near and dear to my heart. And so while we want to feign this and say, oh my God, you said black people can't read, what I did was I directly quoted Chris Rock making a point about anti-intellectualism because I'm sick and tired of individuals who want to get in this discussion but do not have the depth to have it. You can have... him out, you can trot him out with the Make America Great hat on, but I stand, I don't stand on the shoulders of Kanye West, Charlie Kirk. Right, I stand, no, 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 let me finish. I stand on the shoulders of Walter Scott, of Trayvon Martin, yeah. Keith Lamont, I stand on the shoulders of all these people who were killed, all, of all these people, of all these people, of all these people, of these people, of war criminals, of all these individuals who were killed, while unarmed, being African American, Sandra Bland, the list goes on and on and on again. So it's cool if you want to be indignant, right? It's cool if you want to have a, I got the party sellers because, oh my God, he said Kanye West, what happens when Negroes don't read? I stand on that today and I'll stand on it tomorrow. Okay, I, 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 I'm glad we cleared that up. Can I say something? No, 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 no. It's Kanye Beans. Yeah, guys, guys. Being a multi-billionaire and a seven-time receiver is a form of genius. Guys, there, there are many this different is, forms of guys. I'd love to hear it real quick. Hold on, this, when hold on. Charlie, this up, is up, the incentive up. in our politics that's destructive. You guys are trying to get a Twitter moment right now, and that's not how no, I don't want to get it. I'm so sick of people saying they want kumbaya moments, and then you go on cable television and say someone like this. I just explained it. I just explained it. I know, I know. I just explained it. 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 Points. And unfortunately, we are living in a society that is celebrity obsessed, and people like Kanye West are who we are turning to for political ideas. It's not great, but here we are. He is someone who is obviously not some sort of political mastermind or philosopher king, but at the end of the day, at least he is trying to raise awareness about issues like prison reform. I would love But that's not, but my only point is I appreciate, I appreciate that, well, I appreciate, I appreciate that effort, right? right. I appreciate the effort of, of uh, Kim Kardashian going and get, getting one person out. I appreciate Kanye West being able to say the word prison reform. That's not what I'm talking about, though. I'm talking about being able to go to the White House and represent people who look like me, okay? And not only that, but speak to the, but no, 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 but that's, I wish that was the case. 
Like, he, that's what, I, that's what we, that, I wish it was the case that Kanye West could go and sit in the Oval Office and have a 15 minute rambling dialogue with the President of the United States and just speak for himself. That's not the point. He does not. He speaks for so many people who look like me, who, who are brown, who are black, who are persecuted, who are put upon. And so when we have that moment where somebody goes out there and embarrasses us but because of the... Is because that Kanye West's fault that everyone else wants to play into identity politics and say that one black man speaks for all people? appreciate that. However, that rhetoric is, it doesn't meet the test of reality. That's my only point. And, and listen, if you want to have a conversation, if Donald Trump wants to have a conversation about criminal justice reform, he can go out and talk to Michelle Alexander. He can talk to Jordan Edwards' mother, or Lucy Mac, who's Lucy McBath. He can talk to Sandra Bland's parents. He can talk to people who actually went through this, but finding one individual, or granting clemency to be accurate, to one individual is not reform. And all I'm simply saying is, if you want to try Kanye West out, Fine. If you want to wear Yeezys, fine. But my only point is, do not sit here and tell me you're you're dope and you're hype and you can do everything on criminal justice reform because you're Tom Kanye West. Oh, okay, I'm gonna bring in uh, Michael here because criminal justice reform is an interesting area of left-right alignment right now. You're seeing the Koch brothers, for example, get very active in trying to Rand Paul in Rand Paul to try and reduce the prison population and reduce the mandatory minimum sentences. Grover Norquist is very much involved in this. So Michael, I'm gonna get your response to that. Do you, do you agree with some of those voices like Norquist and the Koch brothers who, who want to reduce the huge budget line item that some of our corrections facilities have created? I think we should put more criminals in prison. I see no reason so you disagree to disagree with them. Yeah, I mean, I like Grover Norquist and I like the Koch brothers, but there was this wonderful headline in the New York Times a number of years ago by Fox Butterfield it said, uh, prisons keep filling despite the crime rate falling, as though there weren't some correlation between putting criminals in prison and uh, uh, the crime rate falling down. Uh, are there certain instances where there's abuse? Absolutely. Should we reform that? Absolutely. I am all for putting criminals in prison. Uh, there are a lot of talking points on this issue. I think a lot of them are frivolous, particularly when it comes to the war on drugs. Uh, so I'm happy to talk about it, but I, probably that will lead us nowhere. On the question of is this country too harsh on its criminals or not, uh, I, I think we're not harsh enough. I want a nice, safe country. And this has been a big win for President Trump. You know, we're talking about uh, bridging divides and bringing people together on certain issues. Uh, when you, the Bakari, talk about Kanye West not representing people who have their skin color, certainly you've seen the polls that show that President Trump's support among black voters and Hispanic voters has surged over that. More than doubled among black voters. Why is that? Because clearly, uh, people are feeling more represented by this administration. People are coming together, and I think what you're seeing right now, with the hysteria, with the uh, attacking Republicans in restaurants, is the last gasps of people who thought that it was theirs. They deserved power, Democrats deserved it, Hillary Clinton deserved to win the election, and it was wrongly taken away from her. I think it's absurd, and I'm very pleased that we're speaking frankly, because on the question of criminal justice reform, more broadly, when President Trump speaks about law and order, speaks about people not crossing our border illegally, using our resources illegally, deporting criminals who are in violation of the law, his poll numbers shoot through the roof, even among Democrats. Even Democrats don't want blanket amnesty. I think law and order is a big winner. I think our country's better off for it, and we should keep running on it. Bring everybody if you, if you, if you actually care deeply about law and order, then I'd like for you to call for the breakup of the U.S.-Saudi alliance, because we keep giving them, we give them over $100 billion in weapons. said we should put uh, more criminals in jail, I agree that the fraudsters on Wall Street should all be in jail. to be a huge distraction from the Democrats. Uh, you're alluding, I suppose, to the killing, the extrajudicial killing of Jamal Khashoggi by the Saudi government. Jamal Khashoggi was a radical Islamist. One of his main criticisms of Saudi Arabia okay, was... Can we, just, can we just stop? Uh, I mean, let, can the man rest so, in peace? Law and order, and no, 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 a bad person. I mean, like, this, this is why the, this is why the title... 
I'm not, because this is why the title. This is why the title of this panel is what it is. Because, because in 1982, his good friends with Osama bin Laden, so was when Bin Laden died. One of his main criticisms is that the Saudi government is too pro-Israel. But I'm not going to work with Israel. My he's not a United States citizen. I think a lot of our governments do a lot of bad things. This is why. Particularly, we're focusing on this. It's because the Democrats can't find any issue to run on in the midterm election. Remember when you said you believed in due process, like five and a half minutes ago? Was that enough? Was it killing the journalists? I mean, I think that. like really bullshit, sensationalized talking points, we begin to lose people, right? And people clap and they chant and they scream. And this, this gentleman was a Washington Post editorial reporter. And if you want to talk about something he did in the 80s, so be it. I, I want to but, talk but I'm not, but, 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 but that's fine. You can try to talk about me, that's fine. But my, my only point is that like, he was, he was killed in an extrajudicial killing in a consulate. I mean, let, let's at least allow him to rest and allow and allow and allow an investigation. To happen. I didn't, but but I think that I, and I think my only point in, in, in stopping you and saying that we have to cut this bullshit out is because the audience and people deserve better dialogue than that, right? It's because the dialogue is a sensationalized talking point when we can actually be talking about issues that that maybe maybe when we leave this room, somebody will say, "Oh, I'm thinking differently about this," other than simply saying that, "Oh my God, this was a Muslim." sympathizer who just got killed. An Islamist sympathizer. I, I, I want to point out, though, I didn't bring up the topic. You, my friend over here brought up the topic, and I'm happy to answer it. And this happens all the time. On the left, you talked about the U.S.-Saudi alliance. Uh, 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 on the left, this always happens. The left brings up a, a talking point as an attack on the right. The right responds, and then they say, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's not an attack. Charlie, agree with me. Okay. Okay. And why does it attack? Can I get in on the Saudi debate? This is something where Michael and I might have some disagreement. We, we only disagree on like three things. That this might be one of them. Um, I, I think Saudi Arabia is one of the great enemies of the West and of America. I'm sick and tired of teasing them. Yeah. They're seeing it like yeah. You should not be transacting dollars on sales to fund their unethical war, probably illegal war in Yemen. Um, yes! So, 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 they're also the number one funder of madrasas across the world, which is hotbed centers of radical Islam and, and, and terror, terror cells and everything like this terrorists. And, and so I think the U.S.-Saudi relationship has gone way out of bounds, and they never paid a price for what they did at 9-11. Yeah, they I never agree. paid a price for the worst terrorist attack, probably the worst domestic attack oil in the last hundred years. So this is something we could agree totally on. Agree. And Khashoggi, I, I, would, I would actually agree with Michael that there's probably a little more coverage on this than would be usual. That, that's just despite, despite the point. But I think it's highlighting a broader context of how Saudi Arabia has been lying to us. We've been funding them. We've been giving them arms. We've allowed them whatever they want. And we, we have yet to fully allow the 9-11 victims' families to sue the sovereign wealth fund of Saudi Arabia, bankrupt that country, and make them pay those families for what they did on 9-11. The fact is still, if you go beneath the headlines, we, we live in a very broken uh, political system. And I want to get to some of those incentives primarily because we don't give them enough airtime, to be honest. It's, it's often not as sexy. Uh, I think it's very important. Uh, and so actually, I do want to bring in uh, Bakari for a second because, uh, because you worked on the Obama campaign in 2008. And I think the last time there was an interest um, in trying to transcend the divide was that campaign. And Obama's famous words in 2004 were, was that there's not a liberal America, there's not a conservative America, there's the United States of America. And then at the end of his presidency, Vice News did this great documentary called The House Divided. And they asked him, well, what happened to that? And he said, well, that didn't work out so well, did it? And I'm thinking, wait, well, hold on. That was kind of the premise of why you know, why he ran and why he got elected. So, I don't want to talk so much about like, oh, Republicans were obstructionists in Congress or Obama did this or not that. I want to get one layer deeper there and ask, you know, what are the process issues that caused that mission to fail so spectacularly uh, during his presidency? Well, I mean, I, I think that even from, even our discussion yesterday amongst my friends on the left, we have 
a tension about those policies and issues, and so it's pretty good if we don't maybe get caught up there, but delve to where you want to go. Um, I began this earlier today by saying that in this country we've made a lot of progress, but we have a, we, we have we still have a ways to go. Um, and one of the one of the uh, issues that um, I give Donald Trump credit for in somewhat of a backhanded way um, that we are now actually having a discussion about robustly is the issue of race. It's an issue in this country that we've never dealt with. It's one that we've never uh, that we've never truly had any substantive conversation about. And people think that um, people think that we are very far removed. Um, I, I remind people often, you know, my father was shot by South Carolina State Troopers on February 8, 1968, protesting a bowling alley. They denied his bond and housed him on death row. My sister was born without her father. My family, we had to literally live on, on welfare for a period of time because of the simple fact that my father had a felony on his record simply from being an activist, right? But this isn't something that happened in history books 100 years ago. This is one generation. And so I think a lot of the reaction that we had, Tony Nisi Coates wrote uh, a great piece in The Atlantic called The First White President and talking about Donald Trump and the angst that many, many people in this country have. And so I think that we're dealing, we, we are dealing with the reconciliation that I believe the year is 2042, correct me if I'm wrong, but 2042, uh, when this will be a majority minority country. And what we're dealing with now, a lot of what we're dealing with is the browning of America. And we're gonna have, we're gonna have some uncomfortability and people are going to have issues. And I think a lot of that played out during the presidency of Barack Obama, but even more is playing out now. If Hillary Clinton was president, we wouldn't be having conversations like this. But because Donald Trump is, we're having these very profound discussions. And so that's a part of the reason that I, that I believe we had those hiccups. Yeah, right. Um, all right, we have some questions here. We won't have time to get to everyone, but we hope to get a few. Uh, and can I just say one more thing? Um, uh, there needs to be a question mark at the end of the question. And, and please keep it relatively quick so we can get to as many people as possible. Uh, so this question is mainly for Charlie and Kyle. How would you guys feel about the Libertarian Party and the Green Party sort of pooling their resources? Um, Okay, so I think it depends on, on the issue in question because there are areas where you're going to find agreement between Greens and Libertarians. Like when we were talking about foreign policy and the drug war, there's total agreement there. So my whole thing has been, and that's you know, the whole point of this panel is how will we get along. My answer to that is very simple. When we do agree, we do get along and we can work together on those issues and I have no problem doing that. But where we don't agree, Let's argue, let's debate, let's have that disagreement, and that's what democracy is. And sometimes it's messy, and we're gonna be at each other's throats, metaphorically. And other times, it's, uh, you know, great, and we can agree like we just did on Saudi Arabia. So, I think when you go, when your issue is based and policy driven, I think that uh, you'll find that there are many areas where you can agree and work together. And then when there's not, when you have areas of disagreement, okay, just debate, and that's that, and may the best argument win. Me being more of a civil libertarian, I, I wouldn't suggest the Green Party and the Libertarian Party to converge. They would just no, not totally. Of course, no, I, they would disagree on a lot of things. Yeah, at least half stuff. But I, I would say that, and I'm, I'm libertarian on a lot of issues, traditionally conservative on other ones. But the best thing that's happened in the last eight years is seeing libertarians finally admit that this libertarian party idea has to be within the Republican Party. You see Rand Paul, you see Thomas Massey, Justin Amash. And you see mm -hmm. conversations that even the top level of Republican leadership are talking more like libertarians on issues, which is a great thing. Uh, talking about the disdain for government power and government overreach, all those sorts of things are very positive um, developments, and that's happened since the Tea Party movement. But again, I, I think that there's, there's things that we can agree on, and obviously things we'll fundamentally disagree on. And it's civil libertarian issues, I think, is a good starting point. It is, definitely. All right, next question. Hi, I asked a similar question to Ann Coulter, and I wanted to get your take, Charlie. Uh, when you see numbers like Democratic separate, uh, senators representing 35 million more Americans but are the minority mm -hmm. in the House, Democrat, uh, Democrats represent 1.37 million more people, but Republicans have 33 more seats, and 33 million more people voted for Hillary if Trump is president. Mm -hmm. um, you seem to agree that this, this, this thing shouldn't be politicized. Can we count on you and other conservatives to reform a system that supports them. So, yes, but I'll take a little exception with what you said first. 
Um, the, 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 premise, the premise of what you said, though, is operating under the idea that we are a democracy. We are not a democracy in America, nor should we ever become a direct democracy. We are a constitutional republic that is a democratic process to put our representatives in power. And there's a big difference to that. A democracy, as, as warned in the Federalist Papers, would have lended itself to the tyranny of the majority. Decentralization of power and states' rights is essential to a republic. Remember, that the states create the federal government, the federal government did not create the states. And so the diffusion of power to give states such as Wyoming and Montana, North and South Dakota, representation is critical. That works for both parties, too. Remember, it's Democrats that get electoral votes from Hawaii and Rhode Island and small states, so it's not a purely partisan thing. The final thing to say is this. I think it's very dangerous to go to, for example, a direct national vote, because you'll see candidates do nothing go from cities like Miami to Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, to concentrate on heavily urban issues and forget middle of America, which is essentially everywhere between Manhattan and Alabama. So we have our first disagreement. <laughs> we're a constitutional republic, but we're also literally a representative democracy. So obviously democracy is a very important part of our system. And I think we should absolutely abolish the Electoral College because you have to do mental gymnastics to come to the conclusion that, you know, the people that should be in power are the ones who got fewer votes. I think anything that would argue on the opposite side of that is honestly laughable. I actually disagree with you. Well, it's because the, 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 the whole thing is... <laughs> I was like, I should say, it's fun. being from South Carolina, I think the Electoral College is like dope, right? Because why else would you not... I mean, what candidate would come campaign in South Carolina? Exactly. Uh, if, if all you had to do was go to New York and L.A. And the thing is, like, the way... Like, I'm so sorry. I'm going to ask the point, but a lot of my friends, a lot of my friends on the left after this election, that Hillary won in the popular vote, however you want to couch it, uh, I'm like, the Electoral College, first of all, you can't name a better system, one, and two, we were just championing it uh, in 2008 when we elected the skinny black guy with a funny name, so, like, I, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, go ahead. But I was just going to say, it's a matter of principle, in my opinion, that I actually think, I'd go beyond that, I would actually say, in this country, on the top, you know, most important five or ten issues, I think every year, our entire country should go to the polls and vote on the five or ten most important issues. So, for example, you know, one of those was ending the Iraq war. I think this country would be in a much better position if people got to directly vote on should we legalize marijuana, should we end the Iraq war. But, but, but stuff like marijuana, you are able to directly vote for your state legislature, and that is, like, essentially direct democracy. There's no, like, electoral college for your state legislature where a lot of things like drugs are related to, as they should be to the states. But the bigger idea, and this is coming from Canadian, is that it's states who elect the president, not individual people. So I think the whole balance with the states being semi-sovereign entities that are able to like sort of have the, uh, I guess, lab experiment of smaller issues, I think, I think that is important. So if you told me, well then, let's compromise and find a middle ground, and let's have more of a direct democracy on specific issues in the individual states, I, I would take that, that agree. Yeah, I would I take that agree. California has that. There's ballot referendums every two years. Yes. Like, so I live in New York, and we don't have many ballot referendums. I think we already changed that in the state, though. That's, that's what makes the laboratories... I'm a little hesitant about the whole state. Okay, next question. <laughs> Mr. Sellers, you said you don't stand on the shoulders of people who don't read. That's not what I said, but go ahead. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was. But then you proceeded to say that you stand on the shoulders of various blacks that have died for various reasons. Do you really believe that these blacks whose names you listed were avid readers? Yes, Martin Luther King was an avid reader. He didn't say Martin Luther King. That was a uh, stupid like, uh, question. Next question. <laughs> Civil Cold War. 
So what should we do to end the civil war? Best, best, best question, question of the day. Yeah. 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 Ask a better question than you. I think the only thing we can do is have conversations like we're having right now. And as you can tell, at times it was heated and we disagreed, but then at other times there were points of agreement. And, you know, uh, one of the other points that I was going to make during the course of the panel was that um, I, I said that a lot of Donald Trump's campaign rhetoric was stuff that I agreed with. Like, for example, we would bash NAFTA at every rally, and he said, okay, this is destroying, you know, working people in this country, and we need to, to fix it, and we need to stop doing these terrible trade deals. And I think that the way you bridge that divide is by, again, being issues-driven, because when you're issues-driven, you will find points of agreement, whereas opposed to if you're just a partisan hack, you're going to just be a partisan hack, and even if you contradict yourself on an issue, you'll say, I don't care, I agree with the Republican because I'm a Republican, and Democrats that makes no sense. Too. Democrats do it too, yes. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Thank you. Great question, bro. Good one. Yeah, so since this is uh, supposed to be how do we get along, right? My uh, question is for uh, Curry. Uh, like the party. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. But uh, affirmative action. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion on that? Because I, as a white male, applied for a job in a predominantly black neighborhood, and they have uh, stipulations. They only, they have to hire so many black people versus minority, whatever the mm -hmm. demographics are. Is that fair? I mean, when so first, first I think we need to back up and actually just deal with facts. The number one group of individuals that benefit from affirmative action in this country are actually white women. So that's, that's actually first. And that's the first thing that I, would, that I would tell you. I think that for a long period of time, I, I often tell people that I can't make you dance, but you know, I do think it's necessary that everybody have access to the dance floor. Um, and when you're talking about, um, you know, when you're talking about uh, legacy enrollment, and you're talking about higher education, you're talking about jobs, um, what affirmative action has done was simply allow individuals who otherwise would not have had the opportunity, the opportunity to compete. Um, but the, the, the largest group of individuals in this country who have taken advantage of affirmative action programs are not blacks, are not Hispanics, but they're actually white women. Do you think that there is a time when, after all the great gains that affirmative action has made, that we should get rid of it? Now there are these suits against Harvard and Yale for discriminating against Asian students. Is there a time at which we should phase out affirmative action, and when do you see that happen? Uh, is there a time? The answer would be probably yes. When do I see that happening? I'm not sure. Um, could I ask in? Yeah. Sort of white woman, um, way in. Um, I think, so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I think the issue with affirmative action, and you know, I'm someone who I very much believe in meritocracy, but even though I don't support the idea of affirmative action, I think the people who do are addressing a real problem, which is that there is a big, um, the lack of representation among certain groups in positions of power in higher education. I think we need to be focusing more on why that is, and I think that goes back to let's let's talk about public schools in, in, in neighborhoods where they just simply don't have the funds and where the high school graduation rate is extremely low. Let's talk about trying to bring skills into these communities. Let's talk about uh, you know instead of just throwing everyone in prison, let's talk about treatment programs for things like that. And I think if we begin to address the problem from that issue, then the whole debate about affirmative action might not be as so. I, uh, as now. You 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 actually hit the nail on the head because you're talking talking about a holistic approach. Right, right. And I think that a lot of times we piecemeal because people want to ask you, how do you feel about affirmative action? Well, affirmative action is a is is what some people is what is a remedy to a to a large problem, but it's only part of that. And so I think that we have to, as you said, we have to look at, at you know the fact that African American kids have uh, have less access to four-year-old kindergarten programs. Uh, they're more likely to go to school hungry. They're more likely to have uh, uh, issues that, that deal to, that, that lead to pre-existing or not pre-existing. Everybody wants to sell pre-existing, but preventable diseases right, like heart disease. Like prenatal nutrition is correct. Right. So I mean, it, that's I agree with you wholeheartedly. Look at that. Uh, we're agreeing too much, man. That's, that's okay. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. But you said affirmative action is a remedy. Well, it's also a punishment against Asian American students that do quite well. It's racism against Asian Americans. Harvard has a different. I know this might be a surprise. Yeah, I, I, you, you gave me with something new. So tell me, teach me. Yes. Yeah, so the Ivy League has a different grading scale for an Asian American student versus a black student versus a white student. It is harder to get into the Ivy League schools as an Asian American student than any other race or box that you check. That is pure and simple racism to have different levels for more for different races. And you call it a remedy, it's a punishment.
encouragement against an entire portion of the American population that is about 8 to 10% based on the census data that's about to come out, we'll find out, uh, that happens to be the richest group in America. Asian Americans are the richest group by race in America, and they weren't in the 1940s, yet over the last 70 to 80 years, they did the three things you need to do to stay out of poverty in America, as the great Ben Shapiro talks about every single day. You need to graduate high school, get a job, and, and get married before you have kids. They've done those things over the last 60 years, and now we're punishing them in the college admissions process. So, uh, we need to be specific, though, because it actually depends on which group of Asians you're talking about, because uh, typically when they came from the lower income nations, they stayed lower income, whereas when they came from richer families, so for example, Vietnamese immigrants are actually uh, more poor than, say, Chinese immigrants. So I think that's a very specific use of the generalization, like, oh, you know, basically they just have family values and that's why they're here. That's a cheap, you can say the richer thing got in the box. You can say the same for everything. You can say, for example, immigrants from South Africa are considered African Americans. They tend to be richer than African Americans that have been in America for 150 years multi Sure. So you have to use the aggregate of the data. That's what I'm saying. And, and, and in the aggregate, Asian, Asian Americans are the richest group in America per race, and affirmative action heavily punishes this, this portion of the American population that has higher tax scores, higher graduation rates. But, I mean, I think that, I think, I'm not, I think that the resolve to that, to that conundrum is I think that, I, I wasn't aware of that, but I think that if you're talking about the Harvards and the Yales and you're talking about Ivy League institutions, then the answer is not to throw out affirmative action. The answer is to reform the programs, right? And maybe equalize the grading systems. And the reasons I say that it's not, you, you that it's not the, the, reasons I, the reasons I'm saying that you shouldn't throw out affirmative action is because uh, there was just a recent study that came out that said that if you take an African American today and you equalize his, uh, equalize his wealth or his income potential and earning potential with his white counterparts, it would take them 222 years to equal the amount of wealth that they have, right? And so you're looking at, you're looking at a group of individuals who have been disenfranchised in this country for a very long period of time. And so affirmative action, to her point, is just, is just one slither of a larger holistic approach that we have to take. Just, 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 but I don't, I don't even know where we got this radical, but yeah. I'm okay. so very curious as to your answer on this. What do you think of a class-based affirmative action system? No, I, I don't believe it's government's role to solve any sort of inequities. Freedom, okay. opportunity, I'm not sure. It, it, it's not government's role to the engineers. Guys, let's get to the next question. Hi, this is a question for Mr. Kirk. Um, isn't it hypocritical for you to put two single about Candace Owens and then shit all over Taylor Swift? So how the fuck are we supposed to get along? You mean Kanye West? Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you for your. Um, he used a lot of. He used a lot of. But he's talking about. I mean, I'm, I'm going to give him more benefit of the doubt than his own question than he probably deserves. But um, so I gave Kanye West a lot of praise and then I simultaneously bashed Taylor Swift, um, of which I stand by completely. So let me give a short answer because I don't want to monopolize the panel on this. First and foremost, Kanye West did not demonize Hillary Clinton, did not demonize the Democrats, he just said, I love Hillary. And Taylor Swift's post that, he wrote, that she wrote on her Instagram, of which I highly doubt she actually wrote, and I got a lot of blowback for that, but that's okay. It's probably written by a Democrat political consultant. She said, Marsha Blackburn is anti-woman. Marsha Blackburn is this. She went out of her way to attack the Democrat. Where Kanye West messages, not all black people have Democrats. That's what the first thing he said when he entered the Oval Office, to distinctly different political analysis. Okay, well first of all, I, like I didn't think I'd be defending Taylor Swift. Well, I like Taylor Swift. <laughs> um, the reason she said she's anti-woman is because she voted against the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act. So it's fair to categorize that as an anti-woman vote. Okay, okay, but she also championed over the eight bills that went after domestic abuse perpetrators, so on and so forth. So to say that Marsha Blackburn, a woman, is anti-woman, does not look at her totally and completely Of course, it, but, right. okay, let's not be silent. Uh, let's let's just say that those would be right. part of a group and be right. against their broader interests. Right, but, but, but right. Uh, again, but to, to say Marsha Blackburn is anti-woman when her whole track record, her whole life is about female empowerment in the good old boys network of the Republican-run party of Tennessee, I think is disingenuous for Taylor Swift and shows that she obviously does not have an understanding of Marsha Blackburn's 20 plus years in public service. If you vote against the violence against women after anti-woman, next. All right, next. Why are we debating that? <laughs> All right, I'll give you a little bit of time. We're a better version of that. That's okay, we'll talk go, about it. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Um, as Catholics, and seeing that you support that the government's job is to pr protect I'm life, uh, why would you support recourse to the death penalty when prison technology has advanced to the point where we can protect the citizenry from dangerous criminals without putting them to death? Perhaps we can and perhaps we can't. My view 
on the death penalty, is in, uh, you were talking about a Catholic question, is in keeping with two millennia of Catholic theology, although there is now some question about that raised by the present vicar of Christ on earth. Uh, but we, the, we, another time, another place on that. Um, there, are, there are different reasons uh, to use punishment. You, you can use punishment to be rehabilitative, you can use punishment to be punitive, you can use punishment to protect the public from the criminal, uh, all of which I think are perfectly illicit. Um, the, uh, obviously, throughout scripture, uh, St. Paul writes about how civil authority has the right to uh, come down on people, and uh, many doctors in the church and many uh, people from the patristic era also wrote about this. Okay. Uh, why should we do it? It's because justice is very important, and there are, there are bad incentives that go down the line when you stop punishing people for heinous crimes. It's very easy to sit here and say, oh, I oppose the death penalty for all cases. What about some awful terrorist who kills 3,000 people one sunny morning? What about uh, somebody who commits awful crimes, rape, murder? Uh, why wouldn't we uh, attack those people? Why wouldn't we uh, punish those people? I don't really see the argument. Uh, obviously, we should protect human life, but people can compromise their, their own rights. And if you commit a heinous crime that would leave society better off without you, I don't see any reason not to punish that. And my final point is that there is a medicinal benefit to capital punishment, which is to quote Dr. Johnson, hanging concentrates the mind. Depend upon it, sir. When you know you're going to be hanged in a fortnight, it concentrates your mind wonderfully. So I think there's a spiritual and a medicinal benefit to it, and I highly recommend that Catholics around the world embrace it again. Can I, so we're out of time, but there is that. I am a, I'm a conservative against the death penalty. I'm going to give you the conservative reason why I'm against the death penalty. First and foremost, I think it's wrong the amount of people that we have brought to the death penalty chair that are wrongfully accused. And I think that's important. There are there issues. Ironically, it's actually more expensive. It's actually more expensive than life in prison because of the appeals and because of the amount of legal jargon around how long it takes to actually get someone to the death penalty chair. It's almost 10 times more expensive. The third thing I say is this. Um, if, if I'm against government power domestically for the rights of American citizens, and it might, it's different obviously for foreign nationals, then I, I think that we should be consistent in protecting the life of the unborn, even the life of the people that have done horrifically heinous crimes. I obviously give them 50 life sentences, no chance to bail, you never allow them the light of day. But I think we as conservatives need to be consistent in how we say, well, we should be protecting the life of all people, no matter how difficult it might be, saying, yes, we want to see that person perish. That's where our principles take the most amount of um, courage to stand for. So that's what I would disagree with that. But I will say this in closing, where I'll put my counterparts on the left. The amount of focus the left puts on the death penalty and saying, oh, we should not execute them, and they turn a blind eye on the feelings of people in the womb, that's the other thing I think that's a little hypocritical. So I will, think, I will say I'm consistent from the womb to, to the tomb. I'm pro-life. I think, I think that's a nuanced conversation we can have yeah. when it comes to, the, to that issue, but my final point would be this. Very quickly. I think that people who are pro-life should go even beyond being consistent to your extent and argue against the, the bombing of eight countries that we're currently doing right now. If he wants to stop bombing all those countries that Obama started wars. Right. Yeah, I yeah, did that. Yeah. He did so. Yeah. You know that. First of all, I just want to thank uh, all the panelists. This has been a lively conversation. And I think um, I'll, I'll just close with two points. First, um, on the topic of political divisions, this was a topic that the founders very much warned us of. And uh, I would look to what George Washington said in his farewell address. He said, um, in these times of extreme partisanship, uh, our country becomes vulnerable to foreign corruption and influence and, and creates fertile ground for authoritarian tendencies. And I think these political divisions we have in our country um, it is really the challenge of our time. And it's not to say that we all need to agree all the time, but we need to have better arguments. We need to have better conversations. Um, and that's why I'm grateful to our panelists here. And the last thing I'll say that makes me optimistic is when you look at the millennial demographic right now, uh, if you look at the data, we tend to be much more issue focused than party focused. And if we can have more of a dialogue around that, uh, we might have a better republic in the future. So thank you all very much, and thank you. Thank you.
A big round of applause for Stephen O'Connor.